Greetings in Jesus' name. Those songs were that we just sang were a real blessing to me. Um, just found that to be just that song we sang, "Oh to be like, Oh to be like you." I just found that to be um, my my heart cry this morning, and uh, appreciated the opening as well. Um, Maybe uh, uh, before we go any further, we'll bow our heads to pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come before you this morning again, just asking that uh, you would be with us, that your spirit would be among us. Um, pray that our hearts would be soft that we could be touched by the songs we sing and by the scriptures we read and the thoughts that brothers share. Um, help us to be edified and built up um, and help us to be edifying and upbuilding. Um, we thank you for Jesus, um, thank you that we can ask him to help us when we're in need and that um, he's promised us that whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. We just thank you for that and for your words. Just be with us as we look into your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, just uh, mostly have some scriptures that I want to read and maybe share a few thoughts out of and kind of the 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 topic that I'm trying to look at with these scriptures is uh, the topic of leadership um, I know that uh, Brother Dwayne shared that that's the that uh, whenever we do have another um, Ephesians 4, what's the verse? Ephesians 4, 13, huh? 3, okay. Meeting, I can't remember, <laughs> sorry. Um, that would be the topic that we would want to want to discuss. So, um, I'm actually going to start uh, my first verse uh, is in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians uh, 4. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Verse 3 is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But um, I was going to read Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11 um, through verse 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. 
from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effectual, the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Um, what what I thought is in interesting is that uh, um, these uh, what, what we're calling Ephesians four three meetings, or like in this chapter, like um, he d he talks about uh, different ministries. I think I think we would often. Uh, Point to uh, a lot of these these ministries as as being connected to leadership. I mean, this is not specifically doesn't mention elders, um, but uh, these gifts that God gives um, to His church are, are for the very purpose of of achieving this thing that 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 we're trying to achieve. Um, which is in, in verse three, it says, or verse thirteen, it says, "Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." I tend to think that that's not saying that we will all individually become that perfect, um, per perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I think that the only way that we become that is like, is as a body. Like, um, we each, further down there it says we each, um, by which every part does its share. Um, I, I think that um, together we represent the, f the fullness of Christ much better than we, than than anyone can or does individually. Visually. So, just in in thinking about that, I, I, like if 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 this, I think it uh, seems fitting that uh, that we would talk about leadership in in connection to. Uh, to, to unity. All right. Um, my next uh, uh, verses are in Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 19. To 20, well, to the end. <clears throat> now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So, um, my thoughts in, in reading that were just that uh, um, so, so God, God gives gifts and there's the, the gifts of the Spirit that we hear read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and these these things promote unity um, they help us work together in unity 
Um, but um, Satan also has things that uh, that he would like to contribute to us, um, to to the church. And these these are the works of the flesh, and those things um, destroy destroy uh, unity. And the flesh, yeah, I think I just appreciate how uh, one of the brothers shared about like how the the flesh. I mean, if we take it, like, seems like the flesh never completely dies. It 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 has. Paul said one place he he dies daily. Um, it's not a once and done thing. Like, if if we if we don't keep putting. Uh, ourselves, self, our flesh on the cross daily, eventually it'll start getting stronger again. It'll start recovering from that time when you did crucify it, and then all of a sudden it's it's there again and causing problems, and we need to we need to um, put those things to death again. That seems, that's my experience if, if that's wrong. Um, and, and it seems to be the experience that I see. If that's wrong, then um, you can correct that in the comments. But but I do think that it's something that it's something that we have to keep doing. Um, it's not something that we we just just die once, and then and then that's done. I think that uh, uh, someone recently referenced the book War for Mansoul, and I think in that book. Uh, Somebody could probably tell it better, but but so there was something. I, I don't know if it was self or, or or maybe it was just maybe it was the devil who who had been uh, who had been uh, crucified. He was he was in the basement somewhere, um, but he was never totally dead. So never so dead that he couldn't 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 come back if. Uh, um, I can't remember the story well enough about what it, what what they were what they did daily, like maybe not feeding him or I'm not sure, keeping him tied up. All right. Um, the next verse I have is in Matthew chapter 23. Starting in verse 1, uh, verse 1 through 12. Then Jesus spoke to the, di to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts and best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the market places, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> Uh, my thoughts there were just that Jesus, Jesus taught servant leadership. Jesus taught that, uh, which which was, which I think was was different to what 
what the people would have thought of when they thought about the scribes and the Pharisees and the people who were um, who were who were the Jews who were the leaders of the Jews at that time um, so and uh, Jesus also modeled that that servant leadership and I think I think if we endeavor to be like him um, I think we'll do well. Um, I think my next verse might... Okay, Mark 10, chapter 35. Okay. Yeah, from 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your left, right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, you, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. And then verse 45 is what I wanted to to get to, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus modeled that. He, he came He came to, to serve. He came to serve us. And, and he was um, He came from the Father. say um, I'd, I'd like to just at least uh, uh, try to encourage us to think a little bit about what 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 he might be saying there I, I don't know for sure um, but uh, where he says uh, in verse 42, he says, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Um, so there's, there's some aspect of which... Uh, of exercising authority uh, that the Gentiles did that Jesus was, was telling his disciples that it, it should not be so among you. And I tend to think that we don't, we don't just read a whole, a whole lot, but I think, I think for the most part the apostles did, I mean, I think that's not just for the most part, but we just don't read a lot about it. Uh, the apostles did, um, 
they, they modeled that sort of leadership. They didn't, uh, they didn't uh, lord it over or exercise authority. Um, over others in that way. Um, uh, I guess one of the one of the things that that I uh, thoughts I had that I was thinking about as I was reading this was. Uh, recently um, uh, challenged by a brother that 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 our way of thinking about overseers or elders is that they're like shepherds without a staff and that they don't have authority um, and I never really thought about that but I mean it, it it made me think start I guess think about like what what is like like what is that what um like if we would want our overseers or our elders to have staffs or authority like what like what what is that um something that they don't have now and uh, anyway, that's just uh, thoughts. I guess I'd like, I'd like to. I think it would be good for people to think about, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe if time comes, we we do talk more about uh, about these things in the meeting. We can kind of have have thoughts uh, about that. Um, I, I wrote down here in the psalmist we, we read that God has um, a rod and a staff that, and they comfort us um, I guess the question would be should, should, our, should our elders or overseers have a some sort of a a staff. Okay. My next uh, verse is in John twenty one. John chapter 21, verse 15. Um, and my, my thought here was that um, if, if our uh, um, I'd li I guess I'd like to, to, uh, to suggest that um, in like in uh, keeping with what Jesus said about one, one is our teacher, and all you are brethren. That, that, uh, like when it, when we're, if we're thinking about sheep and shepherds, that, uh, that we are all sheep, and uh, that, uh, some, some of the sheep among us are our lead sheep or elder sheep. Um, I know that some of the Paul's writings talk talks about elders as shepherding. I don't know if he ever calls them shepherds, but but they do shepherding. Maybe it does say shepherds, but um, but I, but I definitely think there's a there's a there's an aspect of of that of us being uh, all being brothers and having one teacher who is Christ one master who is Christ 
um, that if we lose that, then we uh, are definitely on the wrong track when it comes to what, what, what we believe and practice um, as far as leadership goes. Uh, what was I going to read? John 21, yeah. Um, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Um, yeah, I guess that was as far as I was going to go. So, so Peter... Um, that was a, a charge that, that Jesus gave Peter, was to feed his sheep, to feed his lambs. And uh, it says, tend my sheep, I would think. So, so how would a, um, so how would a, how would a sheep do that, like a, an, an elder sheep or a, a, a lead sheep who's not a shepherd with a staff who has authority or who's not a um, um, yeah um, I want to want to go the the next verse I want to read is in First Peter five and I think this might. This would, would have some answer to that, I think, for me. First Peter 5, verse 1 to 4. <clears throat> the elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. I guess that was all I was going to read. So, um, Peter here says, uh, tells them to lead by example. Um, elders are to lead by example, and I would argue they do lead by example. What uh, Brother Max shared, I think, last week um, about the influence that that. It um, you have over people around you and other, other people have influence over you, around you, and, and specifically you shared about how in, in a home as a parent um, you can influence like, like your, uh, your, your attitude, whether, or I don't remember if attitude was the right word, but you can, you can, you can set the tone for your, for your children, your wife, your house. Um, if you, you're grouchy, that kind of spreads to everyone else. Um, and I think, you know, as fathers, as husbands, like that's the, the reason for that is that they're, they're looking to you for, for direction, for, to, for cues, you know, for for what way to go, um, and if that's the the direction, the cues, if that's what you're you're giving, 
and that's what they're taking. And I think, I think in the same way, people that we look up to in the church that we're looking to for uh, um, for for directions, or we look we look to people, certain people, for examples, and. Um, so if they're if they're giving us a good example, that's what we're going to follow. If they're giving us a bad example, that's what we're going to follow. And so I think uh, I think that's why um, that's why people that's why as fathers you're you're responsible for your home and why elders will give have accountability for for the people that they're overseeing because um, they're influencing them either either for good or for bad So my next verse is um, Galatians 2, verse 9. Galatians 2, verse 9 through 14. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised. To the circumcised. They desired only that we would should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For certain, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. <clears throat> But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? I think that was as far as I... Um, as far as I was going to read, but... Um, my, my thoughts, or like the example that I, that I thought of there, was that Peter... Um, what we just just had read um, maybe I didn't read quite as far as I had thought but I'm going to go back to 1 Peter 5 maybe, maybe I should have read verse 5 likewise in, in 1 Peter 5 likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Anyway, um, and also there just thinking about like what Peter had said, not as being lords over, but being examples. Like Peter had, I think, had the opportunity here to, to like to walk the walk. I mean, here, here he could, uh, um, he had the opportunity to accept the correction that that Paul um, 
or, and the rebuke that Paul offered him. And to be an example um, to, to all, I think Peter was a bad example, um, a bad example and a bad influence there to start with, but, but I think he had just as much, or just as big of an opportunity to be a good example uh, there to, uh, to everybody of how to receive correction and rebuke. And I guess I tend to think that, that he did or else we would read read more about that if he didn't. Um, Third John. Thought I'd just <clears throat> read one example of a bad just that we read about like of a bad elder or a bad leader. I don't know if he says for sure what he was specifically. Third, uh, third John verse nine through 12. Um, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he, does, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Um, I think I'm just going to go, I had a, f a couple more uh, references that I'm just going to read. I don't have a lot to say about them, I think. Um, but they're the scriptures that we think about, uh, that, that when we think about qualifications for, for leaders, for elders, um, and deacons. And 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 13. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in, in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then, uh, uh, let's see, Titus. Titus uh, 1, verse 5 through 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things 
that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, <clears throat> not accused of dissipation or insub insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, nor not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. And then uh, I wanted to close with reading um, a scripture that has already been read by Kumpa <laughs> um, in James chapter 3, um, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop and just open it up for uh, any comments or uh, thoughts or corrections you might have. Thank you, Brother Norman. I uh, found that there was a lot to consider in, in the verses that you read, and I appreciated how you started with that um, chapter in Ephesians that those gifts exist to strengthen the church toward unity I think was something like that that she said anyway I just I just had a few thoughts uh, and I want to keep thinking about it not not like yeah I want to keep I want to keep thinking about it but I was thinking about that passage I think it's the one that you read in Mark and maybe it was somewhere else but I, I thought maybe it was in Mark about how the Gentiles exercise authority and leadership. Their structure is, is different. I think Jesus was drawing a contrast between like a Gentile structure of authority and the kind that he was ushering in, but somebody who would be great would be servant of all in much the same way Jesus was. And as I was sitting here thinking, I was kind of thinking about, you, you could almost contrast that with the the centurion that Jesus encountered. The centurion drew parallels between himself and Jesus. You know, we're both men of authority. The centurion recognized that. The centurion was talking about how he gives, he gives uh, orders and people do his bidding. And in the same way, you know, Jesus had authority. Uh, but there was a difference. You know, the centurion wasn't washing the feet of his soldiers. Um, but Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples. He was giving them teaching. He was spending intimate time with them while the position of a centurion would be removed. He would be, I, I guess I don't know what it was like, you know, in, in a Roman army, but at least, you know, in the United States Army, you don't, officers and men of rank, they don't, they're not just on real familiar terms with the common soldier. And I think that would be a big difference, a big contrast, that Jesus was interested in trying to help them fix their problems. He was interested in uh, serving them. He fed them at different times. When I when I've thought about that concept or that contrast that Jesus was making in that chapter in Mark between the way the Gentiles operate and that Jesus was going to operate, it just it seems like if you think about the position of a CEO, an American CEO, he's he's handpicked for that position. 
he's not cleaning toilets and uh, emptying trash cans. He's making big decisions, get, giving orders that are just obeyed. He's pretty far removed. And it, it seems like an inverted leadership structure that Jesus was setting up. The only other thing I wanted to say was I, I wondered, Norman, whether you were advocating for like, like, uh, or I guess it wasn't clear to me, like, or maybe it was just something that we're supposed to think about, kind of like a rhetorical question, like, uh, uh, a shepherd with a staff versus a shepherd not with a staff. If if you were, if the idea is that a shepherd ought to have a staff, like uh, somebody who's a lead sheep among the sheep, maybe you would have used that term, or, or if that's not the tools, not a tool that he's supposed to have. Um, I, I don't know. I want to keep thinking about that too. Yeah, I had <clears throat> when I, the idea that came to me was that uh, just an idea. That, that he has a staff, but the staff is not for him to use on the sheep, but he, he does use it on serpents and wolves to, pr to protect the sheep if, I don't know if that follows in the, follows in the allegory. That, that was the idea that I had. I really liked the, the phrase though. Um, I guess I just, I, uh, the distinction I try to draw out, you know, not that, even though Jesus was meek and, and washing feet, maybe this is just what Max finished saying, he, he, had, uh, he had instructions that were supposed to be followed. Uh, he didn't go around beating people up that didn't listen to him. Um, but, the, but it was still God's will that, that men should obey. Trust his guidance and obey him. And um, let's see the verses you brought out. Um, not by constraint. You know, but but there's like they don't have a staff. There's nothing they can do about it. Oh, the the one place Paul says, uh, "I'm free of all men's blood. I haven't ceased to warn everybody." Um, and then he and then he says then he says, "Take heed, the oversight of the flock." Um, don't, do you know what I'm talking about? Should I pull that up? Uh, uh, let's see. That was. Take heed. I think that was wolves. Yeah. No. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh. Yeah, that's it. So first he says. I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So he told people what they ought to do, and they, and, and, and they ought to have done it. Um, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church. And I, I think that's what he's saying he did. I've, I gave you all the good food. I cease not. It's all here for you. I can't make you take it. But... This is the food you're supposed to eat. Um, for I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves. Anyway, that was just all those verses you brought out really seem to make uh, note of that distinction. Um, um, Anyway, that was my thought about the the staff, fig figurative of the staff. You know, God, um, God was mer uh, Jesus was so merciful to those who are trying to follow him no matter what their past was no matter what their shortcomings were but to those who 
were leading another way, you know, he called them called them really bad names, serpents and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, just have a short comment also on that Mark passage you said we should think about. Uh, maybe it's just me, but for for some reason I was uh, what what stuck out to me. Maybe I thought of this before, just haven't thought of it in a long time. But um, there, where where he where he talks to the disciples about about how the Gentiles lorded over you and so forth. Like you think of James and John, the ones that had asked to be seated at the right and the left. Um, but what stuck out to me there through the reading is like, okay, he he didn't give them that spiel until uh, the other disciples became angry at them. Like, oh, you guys, you wanted to have these great seats. And then he says, um, this is how the Gentiles rule and shouldn't be so among you. I don't know if there's a big um, significance there or not, but I thought of that. <clears throat> yeah, Norman, you gave us many things to think about that I'm not, uh, I want to do more thinking on. But um, one time um, a brother pointed out to me how there in Galatians 2 it talks about James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars. They were pillars, I believe. Um, brother told me just how, what a pillar is. It just holds still and it holds heavy things. And that was really fascinating to me. That's a, that's a pillar. Like it's just unmovable and it'll just bear heavy loads. Um, and that's the description that was used for, for these, these brothers that were considered able to do that. So um, something to think about. Appreciate it. The other thoughts? Um, Yeah, I thought I had a few thoughts. Maybe they were mostly covered by Max and Buddy. <clears throat> that thought of uh, <clears throat> a shepherd with a staff versus not a staff. Just seems like we, we get the, um, the very visual example of the Gentiles and how they rule and we can see those things for what they are. Um, maybe most of, most of what we're called to do is steer away from that. And I don't, I don't know in, in Elder ship leadership um, I've heard different models and different different approaches and I I can't just fault one but but I do think like whether um, a leading sheep has a staff or not um, if he does have one it, it, it can't be had in like Galatians 5 attitudes spirits and bad things like that works of the flesh um, and it also can't be had in Oh, how would you say, like, like the Gentiles had it, the desire, the, the um, honorable place of seating, um, the desire, long flowing, distinguishable cloth, it can't be had in that way. I think that's what stands out to me. Um, but I do, th I do think the reason it might be important that, that it might, there could be different leadership models is just because um, we're now talking about Oh, how would you say, like, uh, different brothers could have different um, personalities or different, just different ways that they do the same thing. And that might broaden it too much. I don't, I don't know. But just a thought I had. And in the lines of how it should happen. But, but mostly I'm saying just, you know, staff or not staff, it, it can't be can't be um, with the works of the flesh. An elder should be way up, up, up above those things. Um, it does seem like, Norma, you pointed out um, that, that guy that wouldn't accept the brethren and wouldn't receive them, and, and, and he was um, diatrepas. There were some guys that, that had made shipwreck of conscience and the faith, 
and Paul delivered them to Satan. Um, if there's a staff to be had, I think that that would be one. But but then I don't. I still think that my my previous point is just as accurate. Like that's the only way to to be for one to be had if there is a staff in that way. It seemed, seemed like there was another um, guy or two that acted in a way that was not not conducive, and then Paul had to either write letters about it or deal with it. Um, that's just a part of part of that uh, that role. So, anyhow, that's some of my thoughts. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Norman, and uh, appreciate all the comments and the brothers. Uh, also, a leadership from an Old Testament pers perspective, and I don't know if you touched on it. Maybe you did. I have a little time staying awake a little this morning, but. Um, A couple of verses from the Old Testament would be, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth to see whose heart is completely his. Uh, to whom shall I look? Those, uh, Isaiah, those who uh, have a humble and contrite heart and tremble at my word. And sometimes in the Old Ta Testament, God shows people who were reluctant. The biggest one, of course, was <coughs> Moses. <laughs> the excuses of Moses, right? Well, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. Jeremiah. And it's, you know, they're free well and the ones that I and maybe you have examples are better than, than than these but the ones that I my heroes in from the Old Testament in would be like um, not like as would be uh, uh, Phineas Phineas when he saw the uh, uh, Midianites uh, rather be when they were uh, committing fornication he just uh, got a spear and and shoved them when they were embracing and the Lord just stopped the plague and he says I'll make a perpetual covenant with that man Phineas he was he was jealous for God but his, with a jealousy Phineas is, that that man was just so strong and uh, and also David David had a was a man after God's own heart that was obvious and of course Caleb because Caleb it says when despised he followed the Lord was it holy fully he had that's the desire that from the Old Testament perspective, those those people had it. That's it should be our heroes, at least my heroes for that. And there's plenty of women in there too. You know, we didn't talk about women, but there's there's Deborah and Phoebe, and there's plenty of women to uh, to be admired and, and things like that. But yeah, it's leadership is uh, is something. And the main qualification, of course, is if anyone wants to be an elder or a deacon, if they have desire, if they have the desire to do it, you have to. You can't be forced into it. But anyway, the Lord be magnified. There's this interesting thing about um, elders in the Old Testament that I, I think speaks a lot. Um, you had Jerusalem, the, the city where God was. There was a king there. There was priests. Um, there were sacrifices. And, uh, and the elders were at the gate. And, and I think that's really important. Like, like the elders were at the gate of the city of God. You know, like, and, and I think the same way today, like elders, those that are like able to help those outside, you know, come into the kingdom. Um, I just had a quick comment on the, I think I was part of that conversation uh, regarding uh, our former le leadership being like shepherds without staffs. And I just, I had thought about it a little bit later, and I, I think that brother... He was coming from a perspective that shepherds um, should have staffs, but I wondered if it was like the rod and the staff was being equated with the rod that a parent has, like Old Testament says, to, to not spare the rod from your children. Um, and so I was just thinking about the way those that work with sheep, are sheep, and, like, are sheep the type of animals that you can whack them and train them certain ways by, by whacking them? Like that was kind of the, the picture I had with how the staff was being used as you whack the sheep. Um, but I thought there's, like a staff can be used in a guiding way, like you just put a, like you're putting a movable fence uh, you know, on one side saying don't go that way. Um, you know, there's gentle ways to use a rod that are not like whacking them. Anyway, so that, that was just some thoughts I had after that conversation
thought I'd share that. It's not necessarily with or without a staff, but how do you use the staff? Yeah, thank you, Brother Norman. Um, appreciate that. Appreciate all the comments. Um, I, I, I guess I guess I will start off with, I appreciate that uh, Brother Robert pointed out that he thinks that desire is really important. And certainly, you know, you got to start somewhere, and that's a good place to start. But I, w I would definitely say if you're not qualified, it doesn't matter how much desire you have. And the level of virtue in, on display and light would, would, and obviously, you know, that's broken down in different passages in the New Testament, different scriptures, many of which uh, Brother Norman shared. But, um, but yeah, if you don't meet the job description, uh, doesn't matter how much desire you have, but, you know, I'll just start there, but, um, yeah, so Brother Norman wasn't sure, and I, and I could see why sometimes based on some of the translations, uh, um, uh, if, if it actually says that those that are in charge of the church are actually shepherds, and I did see a couple of passages I was looking at that were instead of them actually translated as a, a verb shepherding, um, like the King James, uh, sometimes will translate it as rule as opposed to shepherding. Not saying that there aren't verbs that are more rightly translated as rule, but they, they, they decided when uh, the verb sometimes for, for shepherding, they translate it as uh, rule sometimes. So, um, so here's a few. Sorry. Is, yeah, is it in Hebrew? Yeah, so, so here's a few, uh, so I'll start with like uh, the noun first. So there's a few mentions um, outside the Gospels. Obviously, it's mentioned Jesus as being a shepherd in the Gospels um, quite a bit. But then once you step outside of that where it starts addressing overseers um, or people who rule, you know, positions of authority in the church. Um, so one would be Ephesians 4 verse 11. Of course, this is the famous verse that people refer to as the five offices. Um, let's see here real quick. So Ephesians 4.11, let's see here. And, you know, it's talking about what God did in the past. From the point of time when Paul is writing this, this is what God did in the past. You know, he gave to the church um, those that were sent, apostles, that's what it means, those were, that were sent, uh, prophets, those who would actually foresee uh, things, prophesied things from God. Um, those that would proclaim the good news, evangelists, that's what that means. Uh, shepherds, there you go, and teachers. Uh, to, and, and the purpose of that is to equip the saints for the, for the work of, of serving. You know, they use this word ministry. That's where, like, literally the word means if somebody's waiting on tables, um, if they're actually, like, serving food or whatever, that's literally what the Greek means, diakonos. Um, so they translate as ministry quite often. Um, and that, that would be the purpose of serving, serving others, right? Um, and so anyway, so then, you know, the reasonable question there when it's mentioned all those things, are those all summed up into, in one single person? Can you have one person have multiple of those things? Those are, that's a different conversation. But um, it does mention that there are shepherds. Um, and then let's see here. Um, so we're stepping outside of the Gospels and we get into Acts 20 verse 28 so Paul as he's um, saying goodbye to the elders in Ephesus he uh, says here in Acts 20 verse 28 let's see he's like uh, take heed to yourselves or pay attention um, you know be on the watch be careful um to yourselves uh, and to all of the flock, and in other words, all of the sheep, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers over those sheep to care for the church of God, um, which he obtained with his own blood. Um, yeah, let's see here. That's how they translated that. Okay. That they, you know, made you overseers of more to this point, since there's confusion about whether it says about whether there's any shepherding being done. The verb is actually to shepherd the church of God. Um, that, that was the ESV I was reading. But to shepherd the church of God. That's if he, or Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Um, that's what he's saying to the overseers there as he's been them for a while. 
um, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Uh, oh, he's yeah, he's just using an analogy there about a shepherd. Okay, so that one's not really relevant. 1 Peter uh, 5, verse 2. Here's a command form of the verb. Or he's telling... Um, and let's see, that's verse 2, right? So let's look at verse 1, see what the... Uh, here he's, he's addressing the elders. Okay. Uh, let's see what the SV says here. If my internet will cooperate. Okay, so he starts out here. Uh, just to give context, we'll read verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you um, as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So he's referring to himself as an elder um, as well as a sharer or partaker, sharer, in the glory that which is going to be revealed. And here's the command form. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not out of compulsion, you know, in other words, like necessity, but willingly do this, right? So anyway, so all that to say it's, it's commanding the overseers the elders to um, shepherd the flock of God. So just wanted to share that. Uh, I guess one other thought I had too was, um, I don't know, I guess. Say, say it again, brother. Uh, yeah, poimino yeah, poim yeah, poim is, um, that root has to do with shepherding. Yeah. So not, not just well, so point main would be a noun that comes out of that. It means shepherd. So even the idea of the word shepherd means to do what you're saying. Tend the flock of God. Feed the flock of God or whatever. So depending on how you want to look at it, but it has to do with shepherding. But anyway, one, one thought I was going to share, um, Robert and I were talking about, if we got a pen here, I'm going to share this thought here. I think it's a little bit related to what Brother Norman was sharing. So I'm going to start here with the... I don't even think this works. It's a little stubby there. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay, so, so there's this word that usually the word... Oh, sorry. Let me write it in English. So usually the word like uh, Yahweh is translated into Greek as the word that means master or somebody that's in charge of slaves which the old English word is Lord, right? So usually this, but also the word Adonai also is translated as this word, right? Now, why is that relevant? Because in the New Testament, there's a verb that is like that. <sighs> Sorry, English. Uh, kurio, so it comes with kurios, right? So this has to do with like, uh, like this idea, right? Like that you're actually doing something, probably, probably the idea of treating somebody as if they're like a servant or a slave, right? And so Paul tells husbands to not be, or even, even fathers in one of the passages where he says, don't do this to your family, right? So, so why do I bring that up? Because there's another idea that has to do with like leading. And uh, Robert and I, uh, a little while ago, I don't know, half hour ago, I'm trying to remember now the passage, but it was, it was, uh, there's some passages in, in there that it kind of has to do with the idea of leading. And uh, just even that idea, there's a contrast between, and I think some of the things that Norman said kind of triggered these thoughts in my mind. The contrast of, of this is what Jesus did, which is kind of the idea of inspiring people to follow, as opposed to doing this. Even though he was this, right? I mean, he was kind of doing this. And, and then there's the word for follow, which is the opposite of that. And it's kind of like inspiring people to follow, apparently. I mean, I'll use the word inspire, but um, as opposed to like lording over, because he tells parents not to do that to their children. So hopefully you see what I'm trying to contrast there. This is more the, the example that Jesus gave of calling people to, to follow. And so then he leads them, sets the demonstration, the example, as opposed to this authoritarian sort of, sort of thing. Is, and, and if anybody had some other thoughts on this. Just, I was just contrasting this because in some ways there's a little bit of a synonym sort of idea there, and yet there's some um, obvious differences uh, to, to leadership with, with this idea. So again, this is uh, the opposite of that would be slave, which, I mean, if you're interested in the Greek word, it's uh, doulos, but slave, servant. 
So, yeah, and, and even... Yeah, I'll, I'll look up where that verse is at. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, maybe I can do it real quick here. Or even, yeah, like when Jesus says in Matthew 20, verse 25, he's like, you know, like the, and Brother Norman mentioned this, like the Gentiles, don't lord it over them. It's, it's, it's kanta, you know, kudio. Um, so it's, I mean, it's here in that same root. So he's saying, don't do that. It's in Mark 10, 42. Same sort of event between that Matthew 20, verse 25 event, um, where Jesus is saying, don't, don't be like the Gentiles, how they basically... And again, I'll get to this passage where Paul's saying, don't do that to your family, which is obviously um, sharing the same basic root uh, here. Uh, is it? Well, it, let's see. Maybe it's not this particular version of the verb. Yes, yes, yeah, probably that passage. I think so. Here's one where it's 1 Peter 5, verse 3. This is similar, but this is obviously Peter. Um, Exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witness. Okay, we've already talked about that. We talked about verse 2, shepherd the flock of God. Okay, verse 3, not, now ESV translated as not domineering over them in your charge. So, so yeah, it's got the front end, the prefix kata, which is like, can either mean down or it can mean something else too, but like in, in this, so kata with kudio, so, so like being like condescending like in a lordship way, so domineering. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, not domineering them or not uh, lording over them um, is what Peter's saying here. First Peter 5, verse 3 is where that was. And then let's see if I can go back to the base. Uh, no, I don't think this is, okay. It's probably one of the other versions that share the same root, but here's a couple occurrences. Um, Yeah, where Paul was in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24. He said, not that we lord it over you, uh, lord it over your faith. Um, but yeah, that particular per passage I'm thinking about, uh, I'm having trouble remembering what that is. Um, oh, that last one I was talking about, uh, that would be 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24. Not that we lord it over your faith. Uh, I was translated, which is probably pretty good. Um, anyway, let me try it this way. Let's see. Let me just page forward here. Here we go. Think of that verb right there. Is that the one? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sometimes like, right, yeah, sometimes like, like there's, um, we probably don't think about this too much when we're just using English, we just learn what stuff means and we use it over and over, don't really think about it, but like, yeah, when you're, one of the things when you're like learning different languages, I think even Spanish I think is like this, that you learn a base verb, for instance, 
and then what's called compound verbs when all of a sudden there's prefixes on it that give a little spin to the idea of the, of the word and sometimes breaking those down gives a little insight of how they even came to that in the first place and sometimes it's very different it, and apparently it's because it's more of a more metaphorical idea of the total of the compound verb and that's kind of what we have here like the one is prohistami which is the one that at least in my inner later they they kind of translate it as managing which is what you said in verse 4. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 4, and of your own house, um, you know, managing well, um, you know, uh, children having, um, and then we'll get to that other word here in a second. But yeah, so he's to me all by itself is the idea of setting something down. So I set this right here. And then if I set myself, you can use the verb kind of reflexive idea. Maybe those that are studying Spanish, that idea of reflexive kind of, kind of rings a bell. Um, but anyway, so if I set myself, then it's the idea of standing, right? And then pro is usually before. So somehow they came up with this idea of the, that compound idea of like in advance or before, or even in front of, like before, like if I'm standing before you like I am, um, together with, yeah, maybe standing before is the idea of managing. That's, that's kind of the way, even as I look, uh, preside, rule over, this is the way Strong looks at it. I'm not that familiar with, with that particular um, compound verb, although the base verb, he's to me, is, is a huge, like when I was in Israel, like we had one uh, chapter in, in a book to where, which we didn't do this with any other verbs, where it's so unique and so much aspects about it that we had a whole chapter on that one verb, he's to me. But anyway, the pro, he's to me, the compound verb of the two, I haven't really run into that before. So apparently, yeah, it has the idea of managing. Um, but anyway, the idea of like standing before or setting before something, um, your children. But that hupotage um, is the idea. Um, it's a, to your comment, if I can remember, you were uh, talking about where it says like in submission, right? Did you ask about that as well? It, it, the idea, read it again how you understand it or your translation. Yeah. So yeah, First Timothy three verse four. Oh, mo oh, verse five. Okay, verse five. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah. So if he does not manage his own house. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, so this verb epi meleisetai. So so if so if I say like if I don't care about something, I can say ooh mele moi. Like I don't care about that, right? So it has to do with like whether it matters or not. And then epi kind of intensifies it. So so it's like if something doesn't matter, um, if, if you know or you're not caring or mat it doesn't matter to you or something, it's probably the idea that he's conveying there. Then how could you possibly? Yeah, so let's see. So if someone is not managing his own household, who it doesn't know, doesn't know how to manage his own household, um, how 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 would it matter to him, or how could he care for the church of God? Does, does that make sense? What I'm trying to convey there, those ideas. So epi, um, let's see, how do they put it in the Strong's? Epi melumai or melomai? Yeah, is the idea of whether something. It's sort of the base idea of when, like when we say that idiom, we say like, oh, that doesn't matter to me, or this does matter to me. Like not so much about like caring in the sense of taking care so much, um, but just more about like, like whether it's important to you or not, whether, it's, whether it matters to you or not. But then maybe that rolls into the idea of caring as well. Um, so yeah, he's saying if you know, how could you, how could the church of God like matter to you or how could you care for it if you can't even manage your own household? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask the comment, the comment that, you know, I said to Abraham, I'm going to choose Abraham because I know that he's going to keep my commandments. So, 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 so,
just the fact that God chose Abraham because he, he knew? Well, I, I guess, the, I think it's a little different because that idea is conveying the idea. I don't even remember that. And you're saying that is in Genesis, though? Yeah. Okay. Because, like, yeah, it's, it's, so what we're talking about right now is not so much about, like, the children and how they behave and whether they do the commandment or not. We're talking about the, the, the father himself or the overseer themselves. And again, the passage that Buddy pointed out, it's like, how could you manage, uh, if you can't manage your own house, how could you possibly, how could it matter to you? How could you care for the church of God as opposed to how the children behave, whether they're going to obey or not? Because that's kind of what you're saying. And that's kind of a little different than, yeah, anyway. Anybody got any questions about that? Oh, hopefully everybody get what I'm trying to say there. So there's, there's these two different ideas completely, like in terms of, like they're spelled very different. Like ago is this verb right here. And then there's another one, hegumai, which comes from ago. And it's the idea of leading. And it's what Jesus said to his disciples. You know, the opposite of that is follow, right? Lead and follow. And he says, follow me. And obviously as he's going and they're following him, then he's leading them, right? So um, as opposed to this, you know, yeah, he is called Master Lord, but as we pointed out, I mean, Jesus, yeah, in many ways, uh, some ways, he did behave like a master and lord, and like he was in charge, and sometimes he'd make statements where he'd unapologetically, like, you know, you have one teacher, the Christ, you have one Lord, and, and stuff like that, but a lot of times, like, like we said, like, he's washing feet, and he's doing all these things, and uh, I mean, there's just so many of those parallels with Jesus, like, he was not only the one like like the the priest doing the sacrifice but he was also the lamb that was being sacrificed so those sort of dualities or whatever but but yeah um i'll, I'll see if i can find this particular passage because i didn't really find the one i was thinking of and i think maybe it is something similar to what you're saying that i remember seeing that years ago like don't don't lord it over your family kind of thing so I, I won't comment long just um to to buddy's question that that word um um, it talks about in Timothy about ruling ruling over your own house um, in the Greek the um, prostemini I'm not sure how you say I'm to butch butcher that <laughs> uh, it's used as the word rule but then it talks about uh, usage I preside rule over give attention to direct maintain practice diligently and then some definitions I guess it's from two words, um, pro, which is before, and histemini, to stand, properly pre-standing, referring to a preset, well-established character which provides the needed model to direct others, i.e. to positively impact them by example. And then another def definition, diligent to take the lead, underlines the effectiveness of influencing people by having a respected reputation, reputation i.e. one built on a solid quote, track record. This happens, unquote. This happens by setting the example of excellence by living by faith. Um, those, are, those are the, the, the most, um, those are the two definitions. And then there's other stuff too, like, and the transitive tense, to set or place before, to set over. Um, it gives different examples as used in the scriptures. It'd be interesting to study all those. Um, to a protector or a guardian to give aid. Uh, in Romans 12, 8, it's used that way. Um, to care for, give attention to, with a gen with a genitive of a thing. Titus 3, 8, 14. For examples of secular writings, and uh, goes into some things. Um, and then the um, me and Brett were talking before a little bit about the the rule. Um, it talks about three times in um, talks about three times in Hebrews. Um, that that word rule actually is referring to um, those who go before you and. Um, I won't get into all the things. I think time, time has kind of gotten away from us. But um, there's one passage where it's used in Matthew. Um, take probably a little too long to pull it up. But 
it talks about the rulers of Israel, and then it talks about Jesus shepherding. So it's it actually has the, the word rule, but it's it doesn't use that word. It uses the word that Jesus is to going going before, leading you. Um, that that um, the idea is is those who who go before you in faith and who have like established have an established faith record that you're able to follow. And one thing that um, Robert said that I was kind of curious or wanted to comment on was like in the early church, you know, it talked about having a desire um, to be an overseer or a bishop or whatever. Um, I think it's a, definitely a good desire. But the model then is not the same model as today. And I don't, I'm not imp- implying um, that everyone here has got that same role, but I think the model of of church quote leadership end quote um, has got more of a Western um, authority or or a um, a position of influence and power versus um, in the early church the elders that were would take those roles um, they they humbled themselves to the lowest. Um, among the people and they like they would take less money or the same money as the widows would um, they would they, they basically sacrifice they, they sacrifice themselves for the caring and for the building and the edifying of the saints and, th- and there's many examples in the first couple centuries where um, people were thrown in prison um, or you know standing a trial for death and the elders would join themselves in prison or join themselves um, with them to be martyred so that the people would not um, falter or, or sway in any way. And so they would, they would, um, they would, they would do those things to strengthen. And I think that's a, it's just a much different role than, than what's common today is the most accomplished businessman or whatever that, like that. He, he's often looked to as, oh, this is the guy we want to lead. Um, he, he should be the most accomplished in God and faith and in leading out in those ways that are that are surpassing and um, what one quick thought I had on authority um, it's, it's funny Jesus says that those in in the Gentiles exercise lordship but when he stood in front of Pilate he said you have no authority other than what God has given you and in Romans 13 he talks about how the Lord takes sets up worldly authorities and then he takes them you know, he sets up who he wants, and he takes it from who he wants, and gives it to who he wants. And and and, and likewise, it's kind of the similar. Uh, I have a a thought about um, what Jesus talked about. Like the authority is God is His authority, and God's word is authority. And so, um, it it doesn't. Not to get too deeply into the the, the staff and the. And the and the elders, but but his authority is his word is authority. So if it's a young child who asks a question or, or quotes a verse that is um, is fitting for the for the for the application, or or someone who's transgressing the Lord's command to come to them and and lay out what the Lord has commanded, like that is. That is the authority that stands, regardless of where the person accepts it or not. Like that's, if if the person is a child of God, he's coming to them and saying, "The master has given this command, and you're transgressing this, and therefore you're you're in violation of of God and his and his his rule, his his church." And um, that that authority stands, um, but. But when men want to take authority to themselves, um, I think that's where they leave the they leave that realm of you know God's ordained authority.
Allah.